Oh, sweet. <laughs> you got a guitar too. <laughs> you got a mustache too. Yeah. Look at that. So do you. <laughs> One matching. <laughs> this, <coughs> this is a strange days uh, in just about every way. Seeing uh, just fucking you with a mustache and I don't know, being in isolation for, I think going on like the fourth week now. Yeah. Um, yeah, how are you? How are you dealing with it? I'm fine. I didn't realize we were going to do video, or I would have like made a more. Nah, it's cool. Or Nick to Cooper. It looks awesome. You got a, you got a half stack in the background. <laughs> and the red yeah, I mean, and that's just where it sits. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I see that you got the the Marshall back. Yeah. So is that yeah. is that some of your Jimmy James from the Hangman and uh, um, Junkyard had it. Right, right. And that's sort of your go-to thing now? As opposed yeah. to Thunderbird? Yeah, I had it actually all. Um, I had my friend. Uh, did you ever go to um, uh, Revamp while you were living here? I think you and I stopped in there one day, but it was just so you could pick something up. But I was, uh, if I had needed any amp stuff there uh, to, yeah. to get serviced, because it looked awesome. My, yeah, it's my friend uh, Andy. Um he's brilliant and uh he actually that thing had a mod in it that was like a really desirable mod right. um in fact i t originally took it to uh, this guy when i first got that amp i wanted to have the mod removed so i took it to this guy uh named uh craig greg leon right. he was the original guitar player in dokken before george lynch wow okay and um, he was like, you know, contemporaries with Eddie Van Halen. And um, I believe he worked on some of Eddie's amps and shit back in the club days. Amazing. And, and, and Greg's like super cool guy and um, knows a lot of shit about amps. And he looked at that amp and he was like, I refuse to take this mod out. <laughs> He's like, this is such a kick-ass mod that there's no way I'm taking that. He goes, if you want a stock uh, JMP, I'll find one for you and trade you for this amp. Right. So and at that point, I was like, well, if it's that great, just let me fucking keep it, you know? Well, well, but I just found it was a little too... It was very Van halen -y. It was a To me, it was a... Uh, I don't know. It was a little more f fuzzy than that, a little more warm and mushy or right. something i just didn't like it so i had it taken out it didn't have the like the snap to it it was sort of like yeah but you know what i think you know what i really think it is honestly is that um you cannot play these most of the time anyway like when you, even if you're in a rehearsal room it's hard to play these amps at a volume <laughs> where you really hear the true nature of the beast without yeah. killing yourself you yeah. know and at my age, with my fucked up hearing, I cannot play an yeah. amp, a Marshall amp at the volume required to make it really sound good. No. I mean, you've you got to have those hot, power socks. You know? Those power socks that they're making these days are fucking awesome. Yeah, I should look into that. I've, I've, I've got an overdrive pedal that Dave James gave me for my birthday on there right now. It's a, uh, hang on. It's a Maxon. All right. M A X O N. It's a little green pedal. It's that pretty killer. Way? I'll grab it. Hang on. Oh yeah, I mean they're the best. I just I just got an exact replica of that yesterday. Um, like one to one, Behringer makes them for I think about twenty American dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, they're they're a perfect one to one clone, and those things pushing because that's that's a JCM eight hundred. Clone that soft tech, right? So, um, I can't get that thing past about 1.5 out of 10 without mm -hmm. literally blowing windows out. It, it is like Marshall circuitry is just insane. Yeah. The my Marshall goes from like tolerable to there's like a there's no the the it doesn't cascade uh, gently enough. It's it goes from like zero to a hundred. Yeah, yeah, mine too. 
Lindsay. in like like one little tick of the fucking dial. Yeah. It's like not loud enough, and then it's too fucking loud. There's no in between. So and especially the, power the way that you right. guys play in the uh, in the Super Bs too, like you guys are much cleaner. Uh, it it there's a difference when it's like a bit of like a saturated overdrive, but when it's like still relatively clean. Um, well, not clean, but like more ACDC classic rock tones, you know? It's just... Yeah. Um, so, Jesus. That's that's really cool. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm stoked to hear that uh, one day, because yeah. remember for a minute, um, yeah, Jesus, it's fucking sparkle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'm I've sort of getting used one. to the silver one a little bit. I've, been, I've played, I've been playing it a little bit, and <clears throat> granted, not plugged in. It may be a matter of like finding the right pickup for the ebony fingerboard or something. What What was your chief complaint with it? Uh, that it sounds a little honky, a little uh, brittle sounding, and it has a um, uh, a four ninety eight or whatever T five hundred, whatever the four ninety eight. It's, it's got a four ninety eight. That's in. This. Yeah, yeah, that's what's in there now. It's got a it's got an SG standard uh, pickup in it. And I'm thinking maybe like a uh, burst bucker or something. Yeah, the burst buckers are, are good if you want to mellow stuff out. And also the 57 Classic Plus. It goes in the bridge. And it's a 57 Classic, but it's got just a little more kick to it. Which mm -hmm. which uh, is probably better for what you probably want to do. But when, mm. when you can leave the house and actually like go into an establishment, <laughs> you can just go drive. Yeah. Try what a burst bucket sounds like. Um, yeah, the the uh, <laughs> that guitar that you see in the background that has uh, burst buckers in it, I yeah, believe, I was, right? I was or maybe say, the '57 that, classics. What 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 is that? Is that one of the signature models? Is that the Brian Ray by any chance? No, no, that's one of those. Um, they came out like about two years ago. They came out with a series, and I think they made. Very low numbers, maybe a hundred or two hundred. Right, it looks awesome. Maximum of three hundred of each guitar. Do you remember when they had? They made a, a um, an Explorer custom. Yeah. They made Firebird custom. Yeah, yeah, I remember now. They made an SG custom. Yeah. They were all. Uh, it was the anniversary of the Black Beauty. Yeah. And they they so they made like all these other Gibsons, um, in that style. Right. So they, they all had like the SG headstock, I mean the, the Last Ball headstock. So this has all the appointments of a three pickup SG. Right, yep. That except it's only got two pickups. Yeah, yeah. Look at the headstock. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> These guitars were like four grand, like $3,800. Wow. And I found this one on. Um, Reverb. I don't know if it's a second or what. There is like a tiny little. The only flaw I can find on it, there's like, I can actually. You can't really see it, but you can feel like a little bump in the uh, the wood right here. Is it a, is it a bump or is it a weird like nitro burn thing from like yeah. sitting on a stand? No, it's it could be. It's it's hard to say. Yeah, I think it's. I don't know what it is, but at any rate, that's the only thing I can find yeah. wrong with. And so this guitar also came with gold hardware and black. Pick yeah, I was going to say, where did you and, find uh, that? I, even I like... changed all that. I don't. I'm not a fan of gold hardware. Yeah, but where did you find that piece? Those things are like insane to find. That's called the tannin cover, right? Yeah. And uh, I had it made just like I had oh, the shit. rest of the guitar. Oh, sorry. yeah. So you, you had uh, some to... company in some. I can't remember where they're at. The same company that made the pick guard, which is also rare in that it's the same thickness and le layers yep. as the ones that come on the Gibsons, except yep. that it's white rather than black. It's the 305 layer one? Yeah. That's awesome. It's actually more of a parchment color, but yeah. Um, that's so cool, man. That looks, that looks cool. amazing. I think that's kind of yeah. everything. It's like the more. Angus, uh, sort of like the Angus back in black guitar. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's I think, essentially what you've always wanted in, in SG. Yeah. It's the Angus black, back and black guitar meets the Brian Ray signature yep. model. Yep, yep. It's Which the best of good. both worlds. And I left the I left the stock pickups and everything in there. I just um, 
I just uh, took the cans off yep. and replaced them with uh, with with silver or you know nickel chrome whatever. I put different covers on, right, and even right. old pieces. I pulled out the gold the gold plated screws and put uh, chrome <laughs> screws in there. It's it's always the worst having to change all the gold stuff over to, to the silver because you just like oh my god now I've got to do well, the screws. <laughs> it was a lot cheaper to do it that way than to buy um, the gold new ones. pickups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Plus, I didn't want to unwire anything because it is a it is a custom shop guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't want to. I wanted to be able to put it back if I ever wanted to sell it. Yeah, I yeah. have all the gold pieces in the case. Yeah. So I kept all the gold, but it's like. Um, yeah, it's because it's a custom shop guitar. I, I didn't want to take a solder gun to it in any way, shape, or form. So I was able to um, redress the guitar in all chrome without using a solder gun. Which, amazing, amazing. Oh, other than to other than to you know seal the the pickup covers on. Yeah, yeah. So is that is that now your number one? Uh no, I don't really. I mean. Honestly, probably that white one, the white yeah. stand, still the one that's like that, just like the one you have that, in your hand. I love that, white, white that one and and this fucking guitar, man. This thing yeah. plays and sounds amazing. I, f I forget what color was that originally. Well, you when when you were living here, I had a black one like this. Yeah, yeah, but it's not the black one, is it? You gave that back to me. I gave the, uh, the, the the black one was a gift from Dave James. Yeah, and when I got this one, it was red. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, he had, been, he was kind of looking for. He was like, man, I, I want to find another one of those. And I was like, you know what, man, I have two of them now, and I really appreciated the gift and everything. But like, if you're looking for one, why don't you just take the? I don't feel right, you out there looking for a black yeah. <laughs> SG that you gave me, yeah, and I have a spare. So yeah. why don't you just take it back? You know, you would have been stoked on that. Hmm. <laughs> It worked out for both of us. And then I just sent this one down to San Diego to Marty Bell and yeah. let him sparkle the fuck out of it. Yeah, I'm 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 so I'm so tempted because this one's been through the ringer and even though I love that it's like all original and cherry and everything like that, just seeing that dude's paintwork, it's like I I think like at some point, um, when I get back I will uh, probably drop this in to ha have him turn it gold. Like well, gold what's what's going on? What's the back of the headstock look like? Has it been painted so that it, I mean it looks pretty good, right? It looks pretty good, but it's got Billy Gibbons' signature on it now. <laughs> That's cool. I wouldn't fuck with that. I think I might. I mean, be, now, now I, the other thing is that to me that you've got the more desirable red color, so yeah. I wouldn't fucking paint that. Those are those are harder to come by than the more sort of. Vintage cherry or whatever the fuck they call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't like cherry. Or whatever that's what this was. This was the cherry. Yeah. And I was like, fuck that. So what I did was, it's I've had it painted like the color of your guitar. Yeah. But with sparkle paint. I remember it's like the maroon sparkle or whatever they called it. Yep. And, and it, it looks, fucking. I don't know if you can see that, but. Oh, it, I can see it. It sparkles. Before you ever suggested like a sparkle and sort of brought it up, I was. If someone had said, like, oh, let me put sparkle paint on a Gibson, I'm being like, are you fucking out of your mind? <laughs> you know, I first saw one at a, at the uh, Santa Monica Civic Center when they used to do the guitar shows there. Mm -hmm. I saw one there, and uh, I was just fucking blown away. It was way more, you know, at the time I had a shitty job, not, not making very much money when I first moved out here. And like, you know, coming to LA and going to the guitar shows was just like, holy fuck, man, there's so much, you know, there's so many rock stars out here that the guitars at the guitar shows are absolutely insane. Yeah. And uh, um, I saw a Silver Sparkle um, SG Custom with two pickups. And I was like, holy fuck, I want that guitar so bad. And uh, I didn't have the money. I couldn't. I didn't even have a credit card at the time. I couldn't this even is back buy it. In like the the late nineties, early two thousand. Yeah, this was like yeah, ninety nine or something like that. And uh, I just it was in the back of my mind forever. And then I started looking for them online, and I realized that they were produced in like. So no, it was later than that because I want to say those guitars were produced in like the early two thousands, and they were done in limited numbers. But they did a whole bunch of sparkle shit in the custom shop. You can find it out there. 
you know, piece here, piece there, but it, there's not a lot of it around. They did some um, Firebirds with Silver Sparkle on them. Right. I ended up finding one years later. Uh, I, I got a Gibson, and the, the paint job, uh, quite frankly, was garbage. Yeah. The Gibson factory paint job was garbage. In fact, when I first started talking to Marty Bell, I thought he was kind of arrogant because he, um, you know, I asked him, you know, I didn't, I wasn't familiar with how great his work is at the time. So I was just like, hey, can you do a silver sparkle like the Gibson Custom Shop? And he was like, no, I can't do a paint job that shitty. <laughs> and I'm like, he's like, I can do a silver sparkle, but it won't look like the Gibson paint shop because quite frankly, I can't do work that bad. <laughs> I love it. So, love it. <laughs> yeah, I was like, hmm, this guy sounds pretty confident. And, I mean, the one thing that, um, you know, for a purist may not like is that he does use, like, a poly finish. I so, don't think you, know, you could use nitro over the glitter flakes. That's the thing. I, that, that's what Gibson does. And then what happens is the, the nitro shrinks. Yeah. And then you can feel the coarseness of the glitter. Yeah. Uh, and it, and you don't want that. You want the paint to. I want the nice smooth feel. Yeah. And right. like this guitar, it feels like the surface of a bowling ball. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. And, and essentially, like um, the the only the only plus for the nitro is, uh, you know, like color aging and if you give a shit, like checking eventually. But yeah. Like it, if you have a sparkle top. Uh, or a sparkle paint job, you don't want any of that shit. No, at all. you want it to look like that forever. Forever, which, <laughs> which it's going to do. That's like candy case. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've had that silver one now for about three or four, three years maybe. Yeah. Four years, whatever, and uh, about three years. And um, it uh, still looks as bright as the day I received it. There's yeah. no yellowing yeah. or anything going on there. I'm telling you, man, I'm... I'm, I'm Probably going to buy that out of your hands, <laughs> soon, real soon. I wouldn't be opposed to letting go of it, but um, at the same time, you see, I haven't really, yeah, yeah. you know, tried real hard to get rid of it. Well, I, I'm not sure if I ever told you the, the actual story of like where that came from, but I know that, like I moved to New York in 2013, and my work was on 11th Street and the 14th Street Guitar Center was, you know, about three blocks walk away. So once or twice a week um, after work, I just stroll down there and like kill some time because I could, you know, just run into the amp room and like turn everything up real loud that I couldn't do in my apartment. And uh, uh, I walked in one day and they had like the big giant vintage slash custom shop section that I'd always just sort of like go in and just like dream about ridiculous guitars but i saw exactly what you made that silver sparkle sg into on the wall for i believe it was a custom shop and it was uh somewhere in the vicinity of about six to eight thousand dollars if my <laughs> if my yeah. memory served me correctly i wouldn't be surprised and i remember looking at it going like that looks like a fucking paul stanley guitar <laughs> like straight up and um and uh I was like, it looks pretty wild. Uh, and then I think it was like a year or two later, you were like, you just put out on like social media, like, Hey, I'm, I'm looking for a guitar like this. If anyone's seen anything like it or knows of any like reverb or like Craigslist posts or whatever, hit me with it. And I'm like, man, I've seen that guitar. And so like that, I remember like looking around New York one weekend, seeing if I could find it for you. Yeah, the, uh, what inspired me was the, all the, three pickup white Les Paul SG that uh, Glenn Buxton from Alice Cooper had. Right. Just right. to me, like the up there in the legendary guitar realm of like uh, yep. the, the three pickup um, Crestwood that belonged to Fred Smith, yep. which he sold to Dennis Tech of Radio Birdman. Yep. Um, those two guitars are like the Godhead guitars to me. Yeah. So, um, and it's weird because they're both white guitars, which I'm usually not crazy about, but those guitars look amazing. Yeah, it's yeah. the guitar that um, I believe um, Glenn Buxton is holding it on the back of Love It to Death. Absolutely. And then, um, obviously, the, the Dennis Tech um, guitar is on the cover of Radios Appear. 
And but yeah, the or the American version of radios appear anyway. But yeah, those those, those guitars and then uh, the um, the green sparkle bass. I think it was called the Green Frog that uh, Dennis Dunn from Alice Cooper played. <laughs> Which he had a green sparkle base that he painted himself, I believe. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, God. So I just thought a silver sparkle SG. Like when I saw that one at the guitar show, I just had visions of the Alice Cooper band. Yeah, yeah. Just fuck! What an amazing guitar. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad that you have it. And that hearing that makes me think I shouldn't buy it from you that, that you should really keep it there. we'll just have to see i mean the thing is it's a 400 hundred dollar paint job I from know. a guy in san diego it's 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 like i told another friend of mine the other day if you have an idea for a guitar and you already have the guitar and you're just thinking about like what color or whatever finish you want on it marty bell can make your dreams come true yeah I, uh, and the, i mean the, i think I think like when he put it back together for you too, he even like wired it nicely. Like I think you had some sort of. He gave it to another it. guy. He gave it to a dude oh, in San right. Diego who wired it like really cool, so that it doesn't have the 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 way that Gibson wires a three pickup guitar with a three way switch. Yeah. Um, is really stupid I because I believe it's like they the volume knob for the back pickup controls the the middle and the bridge. Yeah. Yeah. So he wired it so that there's one tone knob and three volume knobs. Which is great. And and one of the volume knobs controls the middle pickup, yep. which is controlled by the switch in the back. And then instead of rolling the rolling it up to turn mm -hmm. it up, you yep. roll it up to turn it down. So if all your knobs are all the way up, it's like a two pickup guitar. Right. And then if you want to incorporate that middle pickup, you just roll down so it's just a nice on the blend. volume knob. Yeah. That's yeah, you roll down on that volume knob and it and it blends in that middle pickup. That's amazing. That's amazing. I never use it, the middle one. It's just there for looks. <laughs> it's just excessive, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well that that's awesome. Um I got a I got a whole bunch of uh, sort of questions and little clip notes written out. Um just to sort of pick your brain on, on the, the things ar around, you know, the, the time and sort of leading up to, uh, to, um, repulsion, uh, and, and then into like the cathedral era and, uh, some, some little bits and pieces, um, for that. So, uh, cool. if, if, uh, if you're cool with, uh, rolling on, I am Let's too. Do um, I don't know if many people know about your story about uh, booking Slayer somewhere around '84. Um, yeah. But but I think I think people would love to know that story because uh, at least when you told me it was uh, pretty damn cool, just how yeah. low key it was. Well, in the summer of '84, uh, Matt and I played our first gig um, as Tempter uh, at a show like a DIY hall show um, that was put on by a couple who were in a they were named their names were Phil and Tanya and they were the rhythm section for a hardcore band from Flint called Dissonance they were like the fucking figureheads uh, of the scene as far as um, musicians DIY musicians go and uh, they um, they were putting on a lot of shows and, and Matt and I had gotten our band to the point where we wanted to start playing gigs <clears throat> and we were looking around and we were like, we weren't, we weren't 21. So we couldn't really play the, the nightclub circuit. Right. And plus, uh, the nightclub circuit in Flint consisted mainly of, uh, like in, in the rock and metal realm, it was bands playing covers. So, um, I was totally into hardcore by that time. I was pretty immersed in it musically. I hadn't really been to a lot of hardcore shows, but I was listening to a lot of the music at that time. I'd really gotten heavily into Discharge and GBH and thing the Verrukers and shit like that, mostly English bands. And uh, so uh, I... Uh, I was talking to this guy named, sorry, your brain fart. I was talking to this guy named Doug Earp who ran a local record shop called Wider Records. 
who became very, um, you know, important figure in the story of Repulsion. But at the time, I was just talking to him like, man, we want to play a fucking gig. And he's like, why don't you talk to Phil and Tanya? You know, they put on these cool hardcore shows. Bands come from all over the place and play, you know. So I went to one of their shows, and uh, I don't even remember who was playing now. Um, but I don't think Dissonance were playing. Uh, but <clears throat> we went to a show. And um, I was like, hey, this is pretty cool. You know, a lot of skateboarders and shit hanging around. And um, I, I talked to Phil and Tanya after the show. And um, I was like, you know, we, we have a band. We play metal. It was actually myself and our drummer who went to the show, this guy named Jim Otten, who was my neighbor across the street. He, he grew up across the street from me. And um, his younger sister is my younger sister's one of her best friends to this day. Right. But um, him and I went to that show together to just to check out the scene. And uh, we started talking to Phil and Tanya about uh, our band playing. And they were like, well, what do you guys play? And we were like, oh, we're a metal band. <laughs> and they were like, oh, like Black Sabbath, you know? Because they were completely unaware at that time of, like the, of, <clears throat> of Slayer and Metallica. Yeah. They hadn't really heard it. They probably knew of it. But they hadn't taken the time to listen to it, and nobody in their scene had really crossed over it's still pretty from the metal early days at that point, man. <clears throat> yeah, so, so um, you know, we said no. Well, yeah, I suppose we're like Black Sabbath, but like imagine Black Sabbath if they were really, really fast, like as fast as your band, and they were very skeptical of that, <laughs> you know. So, um. They booked us anyway, though, because they were just cool, open-minded, and very inviting and open um, attitude, you know? Right. So they booked us. We were the, you know, bottom of the bill band. And uh, we went and played. We went over pretty fucking well, you know, all things considered. The <laughs> first time, like, a you know, a bunch of long-haired dudes rolled in with Marshall Stacks and shit. Right. <laughs> two, two kick drums and a fucking rack of toms. Jesus. You know, we had like a fucking, we had, we had as much gear as the other three bands put together, basically. You know? That's amazing. So, uh, um, and, but we went down pretty good. We did like, you know, a couple originals and we did some Slayer and Motorhead and um, uh, Iron Maiden even. We did a, a Maiden cover and some GBH, shit like that. You know, we just kind of mixed it up. And uh, <clears throat> we went over pretty well. So um, at that point, um, we started hanging out with dissonance all the time. They had a house where they rehearsed, and um, Phil and Tanya lived there. And the people were just in and out all the time. It was there was constantly someone there. Right. So we started hanging out there all the time, like almost every single day. And um, when Slayer announced their first U.S. tour. Sorry to take so long to get to the point, no, 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 but it's, 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 Slayer announced their first U.S. tour. Um, uh, I went over to Phil and Tanya's house um, that night or shortly thereafter, and, and I was like, yeah, man, Slayer's on tour. They're playing in Detroit, you know. How cool would it be if we got them to play in Flint? And they were like, well, do you know who the booking agent is? I'm like, no, but I have this promo photo from Metal Blade that uh, – that Doug Earp gave me, it's got a phone number on it. <laughs> so I called the phone number, and it was uh, Metal Blade Records. It was probably Brian Slagle still answering the phone at this time. Yep. And uh, I was like, hey, you know, um, we see Slayers going on tour, and uh, we put on these hall shows. I was just speaking for Phil and Tanya. Like, we put on these hall shows, and uh, we want to book Slayer. And they were like, hmm. Um, well, these are the dates that they would be available to play in your town. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what's the stipulation? They're like, they have a guarantee of $500 cash. There were no other stipulations. There was no rider. <laughs> there was no PA requirements. There was no, there were no stage requirements, lighting requirements, nothing. Amazing. Absolutely nothing. Just $500 cash was all it was. So I hung up the phone and uh, we, I worked out the details with Phil and um, we went and talked to Doug Herb at Wyatt Herb and he loaned us the money to rent the hall 
um, print up the flyers and um, took it from there. You know, Slayer showed up and we opened for him. Dissonance opened. It was great for both of our bands and um, and it was pretty awesome. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, and I'm guessing I'm guessing you made the money back. That broke even. Not broke a lot even. of people showed up because they played. Prior to the Flint show, the two prior nights, they played two sold-out shows in Detroit. So the Flint show, a handful of diehards from Detroit showed up at it, but a lot of people didn't know about it. So right. Right. Um, it, was, it wasn't as well attended as the, um, as that, the uh, Detroit shows. There was like maybe 120 paid or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That's but man, back then Slayer were just un unbelievable force of nature yeah <laughs> I've, i mean to this day i've never seen a live band as intense as slayer in 1984 in a small room all that power that would be in a amazing. small room so, i mean you've seen slayer obviously put on some devastating shows mm -hmm. imagine enclosing the room down <laughs> to the size of only holding 200 people yeah they were literally decapitating people, <laughs> That's brutally amazing. decapitating people with their, with their sound. That's it was amazing. fucking amazing. God, I, I, I really wish I had been even alive at that point. <laughs> 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 I was, I was, a, I was a year away. So. <laughs> um, I guess, I guess you guys uh, took it from there um, as you went through like the next iterations of bands. Slayer was, as as far as I've ever worked out, was sort of your blueprint to try and beat. And uh, you guys didn't set out to become like this grind death metal thing. It just was the result of, I guess, as far as I can work out, trying to beat Slayer's extremity. Uh, yeah, in a in in a not in a competitive way because no no no. To me, um, at that time, Slayer was completely untouchable. Metallica, Discharge, Venom, GBH, all the bands that had a lot of power and heaviness, Motorhead, you know, that's what I liked. When I listened to hardcore, it had to be the shit with power. Yeah. You know, Minor Threat had power and yeah. fucking a lot of the Discord bands were like guys who understood what fucking heavy means, you know, yeah. like there were a lot of hardcore bands that I just couldn't get into because they were, maybe they were fast or maybe they were angry or whatever. But if they weren't able to produce something that was sonically powerful, yeah. I didn't really care because yeah. honestly I wasn't, I mean, I've always been pretty far left in my um, politics and in my personal beliefs but I didn't really give a shit about the lyrics because I'm more of an escapist, you know? But, um, I mean, I think it's cool. I love Discharge, all that stuff, but um, I was more interested in how powerful they were, even their lyrics, which were extremely powerful, yeah. disturbing almost. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what I was into. So rather than trying to be better than Slayer or better than Hellhammer or better than Discharge, we just wanted to be more, and um, I think it just stemmed from my, my hyperactive imagination and my spazzy fucking personality when I was a teenager, but I wanted to be more over the top. Every time I saw a horror movie, if it wasn't gorier than the one I saw the weekend before, I was bummed. You know, I wanted everything to top everything else that I'd seen, you know? Yeah. Like, let's take it to the next level. That was always my, my, my thought. Even if I wasn't saying it out loud, it was always at the forefront of everything that I did back then, whether it was a drawing or um, something I was reading. I wanted to be blown away by things. You know, I really craved that powerful feeling you get. Like, the first time I read The Tomb by H.P. Lovecraft or the first time I saw... Um, Dawn of the Dead or the first time I heard Black Sabbath or Slayer or Venom, you know, it was just like fuck, it was like doing a fucking yeah, yeah. line of coke, you know, <laughs> that feeling where you're like, oh 
yeah. doesn't get any better than this, does yeah, yeah. it? And if it does, how do I get there? Yeah, yeah. You know? True. And um yeah, it's it's weird, you know, like that was the that was the idea. Let's just push. This song has to be faster than that one. This one has to have a more twisted sounding riff. This one has to have more distortion and the vocals have to be the I was really interested in like not even rhyming the verses, which nowadays is a kind of a detriment as I get older and like we play less often and I have to remember all the lyrics and I'm like, fuck, those lines don't even rhyme. Yeah. So at least if it rhymed, I could like sort of know where you are. Recall. But you know, <laughs> there's a lot of lines in our tunes that don't rhyme. Yeah, yeah. And I was really into the idea of that. Like who fucking cares if it, ha it doesn't have to fucking rhyme. It doesn't have to make sense, yeah, yeah. you know, and Matt took the same approach to the guitar solos. You know, it was like, he could play, you, you know Matt's a great guitar player, yeah. but when it came to the um, solos in Repulsion, it was like, cacophony, let's make this shit fucking absolutely insane. Yeah, and it, but it's it's funny watching Matt recreate those solos like live, because he, he somehow fucking does it. I don't know how he remembers, like, because it... it it is a cacophony, and, yeah. and I don't they're know more how efficient you... now. Like he, he plays a lot more like clean notes in them that, and stuff, that, but they're still exactly... like totally crazy, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and like you know, it's funny, you know. You, everybody's seen that meme where it's like a Slayer meme, and it's a drawing of a horse, and the back end of it is like beautifully rendered, yeah. and under it it says Slayer riffs, <laughs> and the front end is like it looks like it was drawn by a two year old, and it says Slayer solos. <laughs> You've seen that, right? That, that, is, that is the greatest <laughs> meme I've seen in a while. And, like, that's, you know, it's funny because Slayer, every time they start a guitar solo, you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> they do have a weak spot. I mean, it's not terrible. I mean, it, it's uh, it's not like something that's glaring because yeah. they're just a fucking amazing band. But they were never, like, really that great in the solo department. And, like, you know, Matt was, Matt was, he was a fucking great soloist. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I kind of... I kind of like that Matt took his amazing proficiency to a chaotic area, whereas for Carrie and Jeff, that's all they knew how to play. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, which is fine. I mean, they wrote some incredible yeah, riffs. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, you know, they, I mean, both of them are legendary, yep. but uh, not the greatest soloists. Uh, there's, some, there's some cool solos, but most of them are just... Kind of forgettable. I, I kind of like the ones from the eras that you uh, don't particularly dig. <laughs> I actually think that the the, the solos on like Show No Mercy are the best. Wow, it's my favorite Slayer record. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I still love I still love the um, Season in the Abyss solo, and everyone else hates that. <laughs> I, I can't even remember. I have, <laughs> you know, that was an album that I listened to like when it first came out. Yeah. I we played it for a couple of weeks and put it away, and I really haven't looked at it much since then. Oh my then. god! I, the first four, the, the first three, I played a lot, and then after that, I was just kind of like, yeah. They, yeah, they yeah. were still cool. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could you could put on the latest Slayer album. I could probably find something that I liked about it, but yeah, yeah. Um, I don't seek it out. It doesn't like thrill me to go. Yeah, you know, for sure. I, I understand why they keep making records. There's a lot of people that dig it, but. For me, I just kind of lost interest in Slayer when they stopped pushing the envelope. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I probably couldn't push it too much further at that point. Yeah. They were probably like, uh. Um, speaking of pushing the envelope, uh, obviously, you know, it wasn't the smoothest, I guess, uh, recording and, and sort of trying to figure out, like, the, the, the logistics and people who were interested in propulsion back in the day, but once I guess, I guess it was Jeff and probably Shane um, from Carcass and Napalm who started like pushing at uh, Digby around like 88, 89 or, or whatever yeah. to, to put Horrified out in whatever form that it ended up coming out in. Um, when that actually finally dropped in 89 and got its, like, official release, what do you remember from, like, how it was received around, you know, you got Entombed coming out, you got Morbid Angel coming out, what was, uh, did, it, did it have much pickup? 
Uh, it felt gratifying because, you know, a couple of years prior, um, I've told this story a bunch of times, but uh, briefly, you know, I was working in a record shop. My coworker put on the first Napalm Death record, and I was like, holy, you know, we, I was, we played side one, and I'm like, yeah, awesome. Flipped it over, and all of a sudden, I started hearing all this repulsion <laughs> influence. I mean, even like exact riffs and shit. And I, at first, I thought it was a weird coincidence, and then I started looking at the sleeve and realizing that these guys were like big fans, and, um, you know, it was pretty mind blowing um, and flattering that a band who actually got a record out um, were influenced by us. And of course, it wasn't long after that that they became pretty controversial in the UK just because, you know, the UK music press picked up on on them and how fast they were and all that stuff and started writing about them. And they were on BBC television and in you know, all the music papers and on the cover of the NME and everything. So, yep. you know, they were like the, the, the what do they call it, you know, the fucking press darlings for a moment. Yeah, really and uh, so, <laughs> so that was pretty amazing, you know. And then, you know, obviously I had been corresponding a little bit with uh, Trey from Morbid Angel for a couple of years when Morbid Angel finally took off, which I, I kind of saw coming just because I, like, Trey in, like, 86 sent me the, uh, was it 86? You know, the abominations of desolation. Right. He sent me like professional, professionally produced cassette of that music and a T-shirt. They had like multicolored, gorgeous T-shirts printed up, and uh, um, they had some money behind them from somewhere. But you know, and, and the ideas that they were putting down, you know, they were like doing sort of, you know, what became known as the blast beat, which we called the cheat beat back then. But they were doing it over, like, slow riffs and stuff and yeah, yeah. really, like, chopping it up and making everything sort of syncopated. And, and I was like, wow, these guys are, like, totally insane and cool. Like, you know, they'll probably find an audience for this at some point, you know? Yeah, yeah. And they did, but it took a couple of years, you know, two, three years. So when, when they started taking off, um, I, you know, I was well aware of them. And I was like, oh, they're on the same label as Napalm. There's this, like, sort of scene thing start, starting up, you know. And uh, to have that label, you know, contact us to put our record out, it was gratifying. And, um, and when it came out, I mean, it got an 11 out of 10 in Terrorizer. That's which was, you know, at, the, at that time, Decibel Magazine wasn't around, so Terrorizer was like, the shit as far as underground metal goes, you know, yeah, yeah. it was like the, the rolling stone of underground metal. So we got an 11 out of 10, which is the first time we'd ever given that um, rating to a record ever. Um, they probably don't do it very often, but that was cool. You know, yeah, um, yeah. it's just kind of mind blowing, you know, for us, like, we're just like, holy shit. <laughs> uh, because what happens is, you know, you make a record like that and we recorded it. Nobody cared. We, we tried to, we shopped it around. No one paid any attention. No one was interested. No labels were interested. We got some nice fan mail, but that was about it. Yeah. And uh, you f you think that like you put all that work into something, and that it it will eventually just blow away in the wind like a little pile of dust. Yeah. So to have it immortalized on vinyl, and then a CD, which were you know CDs were hot shit in 1989. <laughs> you know, so <clears throat> so to have it on CD and vinyl was, you know, very gratifying, flattering, humbling. It was, it was a cool time, you know, and it inspired us because the band hadn't really been broken up that long. And we've been playing reunion shows here and there. Yeah, yeah. You know, we just get together, you know, because the band lost momentum, but we were all still friends and yeah, yeah. we still mostly lived in the same neighborhood where we grew up. So, you know, we, we play a show or two a year, you know, in 87, 80, 87, 88-ish. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was real easy to put the band back together and just like, fuck it, let's give it a try. And that was when Matt was in the Army, so I was working with just Dave and um, Aaron at first and the whole time, like, talking to Matt about, like, you know, I think he came home on break one time and he wrote a couple songs and 
Um, we eventually got out and we started sort of taking it a little more seriously, but I never, at that time, I feel like we weren't really completely aware of who we were, who, what repulsion was. We didn't have the same understanding of it that we do now. Yeah. No? Yeah. Like you've heard the record that Matt made a couple of years ago, the expulsion record. Yeah. It sounds way more like repulsion than like the shit we were writing in 1991. Yeah, yeah. You know, that stuff just wasn't, it wasn't cutting it. Yeah, yeah. So we had to, um, we had to knock it on the head. I was just like, I was afraid that we were going to put out an album and it was going to have shitty artwork, <laughs> shitty production, and shitty songs. And we would always be that band that was like, Oh, it's a shame that they put out a second record. <laughs> you know, there are bands like that. I can't think of one off the top oh, of my head. I, I, I could name a few. But they I never should have gotten back together. Yeah. You know. Yeah. There's a lot of bands that just should not get back together. <laughs> you know, if you've got a Bill Steer and a Jeff Walker, sure, fucking put your band back together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not otherwise, everybody it's like, otherwise, it's like Pet Cemetery. Like sometimes dead is better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so there, you know, not everybody can pull off a fucking surgical steel. You know? No, no, and I was I was bumping that thing the other day, and I was like, man, this this thing really actually crushes. It, it really holds up still. Um, and uh, so, you, uh, you know, re repulsion sort of gets knocked on the head, sort of goes away for a minute. At what point do you get like a, a phone call out of the blue from uh, a Mr. Lee Dorian to uh, come come do the cathedral thing? And and on top of that, what is it like going into a band who at that time had just had their record deal sold to a major label? Um, it was <laughs> it was amazing. So for me, it started with. Um, we were like being courted. Repulsion was sort of being like, you know, loosely, um, casually courted by all the labels you would think, like like Nuclear Blast and Earache and whatnot. Earache had sent me a big package of all the latest releases that they put out. And among them was um, Forced Equilibrium. And uh, out of all the records that were in that box, that one just fucking stood out. I just became obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. I played it over and over and over again. I, I loved it. I was a huge Cathedral fan. And uh, they, they, uh, you know, I, they, then the EP came out, sorry, the, the Soul Sacrifice. And I was like, wow. You know, it was like such a leap forward in a way, you know. I mean, they, they didn't really get heavier but they got more they just got better you know and then they recorded ethereal mirror which i hadn't heard but anyway so around after soul sacrifice you know that that came out right around the time that i moved to chicago when i moved to chicago when i realized that repulsion wasn't going to work out and that i'd worked at my shitty record store job for too many years i'd been working there for like five or six years and i was like you can't work at a record store for 10, well, no offense to you people out there that are lifers, but, you know, I was thinking, like, I can't work at a record store for my whole life yeah. unless it's my record store, yeah. you know? So, so uh, I moved to Chicago, and um, I don't know what, I had no idea what I was going to do. I moved there with my girlfriend, and um, we were already sort of broken up, but we were just like, eh. We both wanted to get the fuck out of Flint, Michigan, so we decided to move to Chicago. <clears throat> and then um, after I got there, um, I got a phone call from a friend of mine in Detroit, and he was like, hey, there used to be this paper called Concrete Foundations. It was like an industry rag for the metal industry. It was kind of like a, like a um, variety or a billboard for, right. the, for the metal industry. Yep. And... Um, and uh, they used to do conventions and stuff like CMJ type things in LA. And anyway, there was an ad in there. Cathedral was looking for a bass player, 
And uh, my friend called me, my friend Sean from Detroit called me, and he was like, man, you really should answer this ad. And I was like, ah, I'm sure they found somebody already. And I think this thing came out like every couple of weeks or something. Like two weeks later, it came out again, and uh, the ad was still there. So he's like, come on, man, just fucking call. Just call and, you know, find out what the deal is. I'm like, all right. So I'm like, I, I didn't think anything was going to come of it. And then all of a sudden, just very quickly, I was talking to the guy who was their A&R guy. And he was like, yeah, you know, send a tape and a photo. You got to send a tape and a photo. I'm like, I don't really want to do all that. And, and then um, at first I didn't realize who I was talking to. And then it dawned on me that I knew that I had met the guy and partied with him in New York. Right. And uh, I was like, hey, man, it's me. And I told him about the time I, I met him at a... Um, New York at the limelight in New York when the Manic Street Preachers were playing their first ever American show. And uh, him and I we got drunk together and fucking had a good time. So I, I explained to him, like, hey, look, I know Lee and Gaz from the band. It's fucking, let's see if we can skip the tape bullshit. I, I'm broke. I have no money. I had a job at the time. I was living in Chicago, which isn't exactly a cheap city to live in. I was making $5 an hour. Yeah. I had no money to make a videotape. I had no means to fucking make a demo or anything like that or do a photo shoot and shit. So um, I, I talked him into just like patching me through to the management. And uh, they called me back and you know, they were like, oh, yeah, Lee and Gaz are – well aware of you and um, they're very excited that you want to join. <clears throat> so um, I flew out to New York while they were doing press for Ethereal Mirror. Um, Lee, Gaz, and myself went to see Death at wow. uh, <laughs> at the at the um, Cat Club. Got high with Chuck, shot the <laughs> shit, talked about doing a Cathedral Death tour that never materialized, but would have been cool. That would have been interesting Same yeah yeah stuff. so it's funny like that all that sort of gets lost in all the you know the history that i have with both cathedral and with death but there was that night in new york where it was in we were in the dressing room and i don't know where chuck's band chuck's bandmates weren't there he probably they probably didn't get along with it so it was <laughs> chuck gaz myself and lee dorian smoking a joint and talking about music and talking about doing a tour together. And I remember that was the last time I ever saw Chuck, you know, was like saying goodbye to him and like, yeah, let's fucking follow through on this tour idea, wow. you know? Wow. So you guys didn't <clears throat> see each other like all through those, like the, the glory years of no, no. And, like the commercially successful years? No. Every once in a while I would go see Death when they played Detroit or something and shoot the shit with Chuck for a few minutes. But, and then, so anyway, um, I, I met them. I met the cathedral guys in New York, and then we went to England and jammed. And uh, and like a few weeks later, we were in New York rehearsing for uh, the Merciful Fate U.S. tour. Mm -hmm. We went out with Merciful Fate, and Cathedral's record at that time was released on Columbia. And um, you know they had Columbia money behind them. Jesus they had Christ. the machine, you know, videos. A fucking headbangers ball, <laughs> tour support, photo shoots, the, the, interviews, meet and greets, the whole, all that shit that comes with being on a major label, or did back then. Um, now it's meet and greets, but the fucking people that are there paid 500 bucks to meet yeah, you, yeah. you know. Back then it was people that worked at local record shops and shit. Right. I think Lee was even saying, like, back in those times, like, you, not, well, I don't know when if it was when you were in the band. Um, but they even had, like, stylists sort of, like, bringing, like, <coughs> racks of clothes. Oh, yeah. To places There's some embarrassing the photos of us from that time. <laughs> I, I, I think I've seen you tagged in a couple of things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, when, uh, that was great, you know. Cause, uh, honestly, when... By the time Ethereal Mirror came out, Cathedral was, like, my favorite new band, my favorite modern band at that time, pretty much them and like the hypnotics from England and right. a couple of other things, uh, Melvins and shit like that. But, um, you know, Cathedral was way high on my list of favorites and to actually be in the band with them and like 
to be jamming with these guys that wrote these fucking great songs like Ride and Enter the Worms and Midnight Mountain and oh, yeah. you know <clears throat> that's, that's Funeral amazing. Request and Soul Sacrifice. It was incredible. All those we songs. toured Merciful Fate, we toured with Rob Halford, we toured with Black Sabbath. It was like all you know, we, we supported some of the most legendary names in metal and uh, it was like a you know, it was a dream come true for me. And um, I st still to this day fucking thank my lucky stars that uh, that I went to uh, disco dancing with Lee and Gaz after the <laughs> time they played in Chicago. <laughs> really, that's what kicked it all off. That's that's amazing because because I think that's one of the things that's always been in my head uh, when you've like shared some stories previously with me um, where. I guess like the metal gods at that time, like, you know, metal was having its own struggles with like retaining popularity and with all of our, you know, god bands like the Most Fates, Judas Priests and all that sort of stuff and, you know, Rob Halford going solo, they dipped just enough that like the aspiring sort of like underground kind of touched and you guys got to do those tours together, whereas like thinking about it now, like if you know, the black, the last Black Sabbath tour, they could have taken out and, you know, done some underground sort of showcase for, like, cool stuff that's ha happening now, but, you know, they, yeah. they, they did not. So <laughs> no. It's, it's just such they a did. cool cool thing that, like... They did take out Uncle Acid in Europe, which is did. cool. Yeah. First, on the first leg of the tour, and then they... And then they hooked up with that rival Sons band, um, who, you know, they're not... They're a pretty good band and everything, but... Um, They're not kind of a grim choice, you know. Yeah. Like it would be cool to see Sabbath go out with some more underground bands on the on the bill, yeah. but whatever. They, they, they don't owe that to anybody. No, they can do whatever the fuck they want. But but yeah, I mean, when we toured with them, it was like fucking a. I mean, I think the American leg of the we did the Cross Purposes tour. I want to yeah. say the American leg had Motorhead and Morbid Angel as the support acts. Wow. And w when it was in Europe, it was us and um, a band called Godspeed, which had um, Tommy from uh, Solus and uh, Rob, uh, who plays bass and or was playing bass in Lethal Aggression, and uh, Chris Kozik. Is it Chris? Is that his last name? Chris, the bass player. They had two bass players. The one bass player was in Lethal Aggression. The other one is in Atomic Bitchwax. Right. Cool. And actually, I think now he's in Monster Magnet. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, their band was called Godspeed. They were signed to Atlantic, and they were um, managed by Geezer's wife. Oh, wow. Okay. Crazy. So they got on the tour through their through Geezer's wife, and we got on the tour, I believe, because our manager um, had some yeah. Black Set connections. But, yeah, it was um, cool. That, that was a... Um there was a story, and we can we can cut this out if you don't want to tell the story. But there was a story one time you told me about Lane Staley and Black Sabbath. Oh yeah, I don't think that that necessarily needs to be cut out. It's 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 a it's I don't a know that I've ever story. I don't know if I've ever seen it in print. I've had some people tell me that uh, that I'm crazy, but I'm not because <laughs> I heard it. And um, I would love for that call, story to make you can you can Skype Gaz and. And Lee, Lee will back this up too when you do, when you talk to him. Um, we were talking to Iomi one day, and he was talking about the uh, the Sabbath tribute album that was coming out because we recorded some songs for it. Right. And I think Gaz, Gaz was pretty bold. You know, he would like just start shooting the shit with Iomi. I was a little more like, <laughs> you know, wait for him to speak to me, kind of thing. But Gaz would just steam in there and start talking to him. And I think um, we played him the songs that we recorded for the record. They didn't make it to the record in the end. It was like this um, Columbia Records tribute to Black Sabbath that came out. And one of the tracks was The Wizard. And on the final version that came out, it's like Geezer and Bill Ward. I think Wino is the guitar player and Rollins maybe is the vocalist. Wow. Something like that. When they originally recorded the track, 
it was the three original musicians in Sabbath with Lane Staley on vocals. It was Iomi, Butler, Ward, and Lane Staley. And it was fucking awesome. It was slightly slower than the original version, very dirgy and heavy. And Lane Staley fucking nailed it. You know, that's right in his wheelhouse. Yeah. And uh, it was fucking awesome. And Iomi played it for us. And he even gave us the cassette and said, here, you can make a copy of this if you want. And it was the last day of the tour. We were in Switzerland in some fucking mountain town. And it was a Sunday. So everything was fucking shut. But Gaz and I ran around the city for like four hours looking for like a hi-fi shop with a dual well cassette deck that we could go in and just be like, can you just put this tape in and make us a copy of it? Yeah, yeah. We couldn't find a dual well cassette player anywhere. And uh, we had the blank cassette and the cassette that Iomi gave us, and we ran all over the city looking for a place to dupe it. We never found a place. It was Everything was shut. We finally gave up. Gave the tape back to him. We're like, ah, fuck it. We'll hear it when it comes out. And then it never came out. Never saw the live date. Oh, my God. No. I would, I would love it. It really should fucking put that out. I don't know who owns the rights to that. I don't know what happened to it. But it's really unfortunate that that fucking got away. Uh-huh. I know some people who, um, you know, have seriously doubted me on that. But it's 100% true. Well, uh, they they can suck it because uh, I'll get I'll get Lee's account of it on tape, and uh, hopefully Gaz does one of these with me too. That, that would be yeah, right. good luck with that. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. It's hard to get him to answer an email. I'm I'm uh, I'm ambitious if nothing else. So, <laughs> um, I remember uh, one time I I, I wasn't able to join uh, you and Del for lunch, and we can also cut this if this is a uh, delving. Um, too deep, but but you guys ran into Sebastian Bach, and and there was a funny story from around that time where he had had a, an incident, and he was trying to put it into his book. Yeah, well, he'd forgotten about it actually, and um, we yeah, I was with Dell at a record shop in Burbank, and Sebastian was across the street at a. Um, some cafe and he come running out and was yelling at Dell. So we went over to meet him and he was like, yeah, you look familiar. And I'm like, yeah, we met many times. We, I, I'd met Sebastian. He used to live in Toronto. When he's, he's probably a little bit younger than me. And, uh, he used to live in Toronto and I lived in Michigan. So I would go up to Toronto all the time and go to rock shows and stuff. And Sebastian was always at the shows. He was, you know, trying to get into a bit, you know, he was working it, yep. trying to do his thing at that time. So I, I'd seen him a bunch of times around at the clubs in Toronto. And then I met him, uh, when Cathedral, um, was on tour with Halford and he came to, he was friends with Rob Halford. He came to the show and he loved Cathedral. He'd been listening to the Ethereal Mirror record and he came in the dressing room and he was like singing ride. He knew the lyrics <laughs> and uh, he was totally into it. And um, he brought some weed that he grew himself in his house and like smoked us out. We drank a bunch of whiskey and um, some guy was beating on his girlfriend, like pushing her around. Sebastian went over, was like, Hey man, if I can you know, leave this woman alone. And the guy was like, Oh, she's the mother of my kid. I'll do whatever the fuck I want. And Sebastian was like, oh, yeah, I'll do whatever I want. And he fucking took his beer bottle and fucking smashed it over the guy's head. Holy fuck. <laughs> and uh, the security came in and broke it up. And Sebastian had cut his hand really badly. Like that kind of cut where, like, the blood looks black. Yeah. It's so uh. deep that there's, like, black blood coming out. Uh. And uh, he was sitting there, and he just came back, and he was so fired up. He was just, like, talking to us. I'm like, man, you need – I think you need stitches. And he's like, oh, I'll be all right. So I fucking wet it down a towel and ra- gave it to him to wrap around his hand. He hung out for a while. And um, um, so anyway, when I, that day I ran into him, I told him that story. I'm like, you might remember this. And he was just like, fuck. 
<laughs> he's like, I just turned in the fucking manuscript for my book last week, and I forgot to put that fucking story in there. <laughs> and he, so yeah, that was funny. That's that's amazing. Um, I hope I hope one day that, that that makes it a print. If not in in this, if uh, if Blabbermouth ever pick any of this up, <laughs> um, uh, which which is something funny. I, I actually uh, for the Fred interview, I. Uh, I sent the blabbermouth email like that and with like some tidbits that they, they should pick out and I was like, I met you at the the rainbow one time with with Scott. <laughs> uh-huh. Just just hopefully that he would actually go like, Oh, okay, cool. Let me let me put this in the print. But um um the next the next thing that I wanted to uh, sort of touch on was um Sven. so so albert from decibel writes uh the choosing death book and i guess through that time uh you guys all get your like memories sprung and like feel like a keen sense of nostalgia especially nick perhaps and uh i i guess he reaches out to you and says like hey i think i might fire up the riff machine and try to put something together and uh like how how did that all come about, and um, what 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 do you remember about Death Breath and Death Breath Two? Is oh uh, well, I mean that first record, yeah, it was just like you say, you know, it there were no expectations because it was just basically Nick, you know, reaching out and through email and saying like, hey, I'm gonna put this record together, I'd like you to sing on it, and. Um, I was like, sure, of course, you know, anything to work with Nick, you know, yeah, yeah. and he's a fucking one of the best death metal riff writers of all time. So, um, I figured, yeah, that's going to be fucking good no matter what, you know? Yeah. So, um, I didn't know Robert Harrison at the time. In fact, I didn't know Robert until, uh, until I went over there to jam with them, you know, yeah. um, to before when we did like the debut show. So, for me, it was just like, okay, I'm going to do this death metal thing with Nick. And, um, you know, he sent me the songs. I'm like, yeah, cool. They, you know, they sound like death and autopsy and whatnot. You know? <laughs> so uh, I thought it was cool. Um, he sent me the, I think he had done like a scratch vocal just so I'd know where the vocals went. And um, It was easy for me. You know, I recorded the vocals over at Matt's, uh, the place where Matt was working at the time. Matt engineered the vocal recording for me, actually on both uh, Breath Records. <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, freaking cool. Hope <laughs> you do it again someday. <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's uh, that's the hope that we all we all live in. And uh, but you guys, you guys did a small European tour, right? Uh, not European, just Scandinavian. And yeah, we played oh. like uh, Finland, Norway, Sweden. Played right. a bunch of shows in Sweden. Right. I think we did like a two-week tour one time where we did about uh, six or seven shows in Sweden, maybe eight, and then we did two in. Uh, we did at least one show in Norway, and at least one show. We I know we did Oslo and Helsinki. Right. And and the the big the big Sven backdrop that you guys had, I think that mm-hmm. that thing sort of met an untimely death, perhaps. No, it's probably still around. I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's in the uh, helicopters. Uh, um, yeah, sort of. <laughs> like the, where they're where, no, not like where they store all their gear. All oh, right, right, right. I think uh, I think someone was once telling me that you had to keep like soaring the top off to get it into each different venue or on, onto a stage. Yeah, yeah, like uh, we made it out of plywood, uh, <laughs> which was probably pretty stupid. We could have easily just made it out of a sheet and cut a hole <laughs> yeah. and stuck the smoke machine through there. Yeah. But no. Yeah, yeah. of course. Think it, we made it out of plywood. Of course. I think we were thinking that we had to like... Um, you know, have something to mount the smoke machine hose to. Right. But wouldn't it have just been just as easy to like put a chair back there and like, yes. you know, gaffer tape the fucking yeah. hose to the fucking chair and stick it through the <laughs> hole? Yeah. There were plenty of other options besides building the thing out of a 
fucking 15 foot high wall of <laughs> plywood. Um, would you would you say that any time in the future then there, there might be a uh, another death breath release? Should should we should we hold our breath or should we should we move on with our lives? Oh, I would move on with your life because <laughs> um, if, if it happens, it'll be probably pretty unexpectedly, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is the uh, looking the at a band made up of um, two guys who run recording studios. Yeah, have solo careers, um, and in the case of Nick, is in three bands. Yeah. So uh, already, not counting Death Breath. So he's in three bands. Um, Robert has a solo project. Um, they both run recording studios. And then I live in America, so. Yeah, yeah. I have um, a full-time job. So it's, it's sort of, uh, it has to sort of like the stars have to align for it to happen, you know. True. Um, doing stuff with uh, Lee has been, Lee and Gaz has been easier because um, they have a lot more, you know, Lee has a, not so much now that he has a daughter, but you know, his schedule is a little more, um, he can, he can work, manage his time. Yeah. Yeah. It's not in three fucking bands. Yeah. You know, he does, <laughs> he does have a record label and a daughter. And for years he had cathedral plus, you know, putting out fires with other people's bands and, you know, yeah, everything yeah. else that he does. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, you know, there's, there's ways to make time for that to happen. But, um, death breath is just, you know, it's a little, it's more difficult. Also Sweden is further and more expensive to get to than London. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, some questions more on like record collecting now. Uh, you're the one that set me off into this journey right now. Um, of <laughs> the way that the way that you explained it, I think I think this is going to make like anyone who has a taste for like new wave British heavy metal um, sort of go out and try and like accomplish this task. But you once said to me that like one thing that you sort of go into every weird. Um, record store that you can when you're like traveling around you you always look for the first tank record with the bonus seven inch no i told you that uh i read that it was when when you were looking for it maybe um right. it, was, it was i was i referred to an article that was i think it was in spin magazine with mud honey right and that was actually uh matt lucan of mud honey who said that and like they were asking each individual member of mud honey like, what do you do to kill time on tour? And right. like, I must you know, have traveled through that pot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of them said, you know, I go bowling, whatever the fuck they do. And when they asked Matt Lucan, like, what do you do when you're on tour to kill time? He said, I go to record stores and look for the first Tank album with the seven inch in it. <laughs> Which is like one of the like one of the most obscure and cool actual tasks to try to undertake yeah. as a you know, record collector. Yeah. Because uh, I I tried all across Japan. Like I went into every nook and cranny that I could. <laughs> Just... Yeah. <laughs> it's a British pressing, so. But there is a ooh, there's an Aussie one that has a patch. Really. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Because uh, I well, I was supposed to head down to Melbourne recently, but uh, and I was going to go into vicious sloth and uh, fucking raid everything that they had, but. Um, yeah. You know, uh, we're, we're currently locked down, so that didn't. Yeah, when that didn't the uh, when the Aussie dollar took a dip, I uh, I bought a copy of Mother's Choice, which is like a Buffalo record that's really not that great, yeah, but yeah. Um, the price suddenly seemed appealing. Yeah, yeah, and, and so even those even those two kind of shitty Buffalo records are still <laughs> expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, they're not nearly as expensive as the first three. No, but they're still expensive and prohibitively expensive because they're not really that good yeah yeah because the, the it's, it's like buying a, a tuning pedal for your pedal board it's like fuck <laughs> it's to spend like a hundred bucks yeah on a tuning pedal I don't even think. <clears throat> yeah um yeah so i bought mother's choice um yeah yeah 
That's thank you. Cool. <laughs> shitty economy. <laughs> yeah. so thank you, Monopoly Money. One of the perks of a shitty economy is, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I was able to buy a couple records on the cheap. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the record collectors out there, since you are such a keen, I guess, bloodhound in, in terms of finding, like, incredible records what what records what three records from the 70s would you say that people should equally enjoy and seek to find as say rare items to have hmm. well a lot of times the rare stuff is what you start looking for when you've already exhausted all of the obvious things you know in some cases um, there are obscure records that are absolutely mind-blowingly brilliant and should be up there in the fucking legendary status with the Beatles and Sabbath and all the greats. You know, we could go on and on. Yeah. For instance, the first T2 record. Right. It'll all work out in Boomland. The only one that they actually released while they were a functioning band. Um, that record is a fucking masterpiece. Okay. And and should be uh, should be widely known, but it's not. I mean, for one thing, it has four songs on it. Yeah. That makes it a bit difficult. It's a prog record. Not everybody is into the fucking flutes and the mellotrons and shit like that. But um, brilliant record. Um, a less. Uh, obscure one that I think is like to me one of the greatest records of all time and certainly one of the very best records of the 70s is Golden Earrings Moon Tan. I, I thought you might say that because I, yeah. I don't think many people who more know you from metal would be aware of that record per se. And then just for some ass kicking barn burners, I would go with. Hard stuff, bulletproof, or uh, you know, riot, Narita. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you were the one who showed me right, and uh, still to this day, I, I I put that on. And uh, I think it was your Stars shirt that actually got me into Stars. Cause, like, yeah. I was like, what band is that? And I, I searched it up, and I was like, fuck, this is awesome. Um, I there was a I turned Nick onto Stars. Yeah, the same he, night, he turned me on to uh, Rex. Wow. Rex okay. is um, Rex Smith is the singer of Rex, and he's the brother of Michael Lee Smith, the singer of Stars. Wow. And uh, when when uh, we were, I think it was when we were doing the first Death Breath show. Um, I was staying at Nick's flat in Stockholm, and uh, one night him and I stayed up late drinking, and we were playing records and he played Rex for me and I was like oh fuck this is really cool you know like I, I I wasn't aware I'd seen those records but I didn't know that they were any good and um <clears throat> he's like yeah this is you know Rex Smith and I'm like yeah I you know I I said I'm quite familiar with Stars his brother's band and Nick hadn't heard Stars so I played him Stars and uh so we turned each other on to the Smith brothers that night. And, and then, uh, not long after that, Nick, like, you know, being the obsessive, um, musician that he is, <laughs> he found all the records and he also discovered that the, um, the logo, the stars logo was drawn by the guy who did the, um, the cover of kiss rock and roll over. Wow. Which was of great interest to Nick. Yeah, yeah. Those are the only two rock pieces that he had ever done. Wow. He's actually done a third now because he did the cover of Kiss's Sonic Boom. But the only two things he ever did for rock bands were the Stars logo and the cover of Kiss Rock and Roll Over. And they were both around the same time. And uh, uh, I think there, there used, Nick used to do a little blog on the Helicopters website. Yep. And he wrote a blog about Stars. And he talked, that's where I remember reading that information. That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing, because, uh, I mean, if anyone doesn't know out there, Nick might be possibly the biggest Kiss fan, perhaps. <laughs> mm -mm, no, not even close. <laughs> Nick is uh, Nick is one, he's a guy who likes Kiss from the 70s. Okay. Although, I, I will say that uh, one of the times 
that I was over in Stockholm working on one of the death breath things. Um, I got in his car and he had Paul Stanley's new solo album, which I believe was called live to win or something like that. And we drove around Stockholm listening to that record all day. So yeah, he might be, he's a kiss fan, but uh, there's, there's a difference between a guy like Nick and then like a Greg Jornigan, you know, uh, I mean, well, who yeah. has like, you know, a room full of kiss dolls and yeah. trash cans and, Backpacks and Shout lunch boxes. Out to Greg. And, yeah, yeah. I miss you, buddy. Uh, <laughs> he, no, he, he. I think Greg is definitely the biggest Kiss fan I've ever met. Thinking about it, like all all the stuff, the rare gems, and I yeah. think he even like had something out of Ace, like went to an Ace Billy like estate auction or something like that. And, like, yeah. Just, wow. But you know, there's there's and there's guys also. You know, Greg is an obsessive Kiss collector. Yeah. But there are then these fans who like think that every record they ever made is great. That's a real fan. Somebody who thinks the last Kiss record is great, or somebody who thinks that it's perfectly fine that Tommy Thayer and Eric Singer are wearing the makeup of the yeah. dudes from the seventies. You know, which sure it's it is perfectly fine, but for me it's it rings a little bit hollow. You know, yeah, yeah. because I'm not. I'm, I don't love them unconditionally. Yeah, um, but I, I do. I am a Kiss fan. You know, in the seventies, I was a big Kiss fan. <laughs> um, I guess on the, in the same vein that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Metallica apologist. <laughs> um, I, I was, I was, I was gonna say like, uh, it seems, it seems that um, through a lot of these that uh, a lot of the people because they're much. You know, they're from a time before I was alive. And a lot of these people actually got to see Metallica, you know, in the glory days, like on Kill 'em All, Ride the Lightning. Yeah. And I always I always try to like pull up um everyone's experience of like sort of seeing Cliff Burton in person, be it had they met them or just actually watching Cliff play a show. Uh when was the first time that you got to see Metallica? I didn't get to see Metallica until um, and I say not until, but it was still pretty early considering, you know, um, I mean, I consider myself lucky. I saw them twice on the Ride the Lightning tour, uh, both headline shows. Right. And, and uh, in early 85, like January or February of 85. And uh, the first one, I was like right up front and I was right in front of Cliff Burton. I could feel the fucking wind coming off of him when his hair was fucking <laughs> flopping around and his fucking bell bottoms were right in front of my face when he put his foot up on the <laughs> monitor. Uh, it was like the ultimate Cliff Burton experience. He fucking stood right in front of me and played, uh, you know, anesthesia. And uh, it was fucking amazing. You know, Metallica was still like absolutely, I mean, they were just, it was, they were just crushing, you know, they were so fucking good. Um, they weren't as good as Slayer live, gotta say. Slayer was just an absolute killing machine. But Metallica was a great live band. I mean, first of all, Slayer in a small club, Dave Lombardo, beating the fuck out of his drums, you know, playing that intro to the song Show No Mercy, which was live, it was like fucking three, four times as fast as, as it is on the record, you know? <laughs> they were incredible. And Metallica was playing bigger places already, so... You know, they were playing like a, you know, 1200 seater at that point, oh, you know, wow, but okay. still <clears throat> it was fucking awesome to see Metallica back then. They were incredible. Um, and I saw them again with Cliff Burton uh, uh, on the Master of Puppets tour. And then I saw one of the first shows of Jason right. uh, on the Master of Puppets tour in Toronto. Right. They were, they were, uh, they played at um, Maple Leaf Gardens in early December of 86, like, you know, they had just really gotten yeah. back on the ground running. Yeah. And, uh, that was a, that was a great show. That's that was a really amazing. incredible show. That's amazing. And of course I've seen them countless times after that, but, um, by that point I was a jaded fuck and yeah. <laughs> seen a million shows and, 
And uh, I, in the, in the interim, I turned 21 and started getting drunk at all the shows I went to. So yeah. Yeah. my memory level of thing, unless it was a band I really, really was excited about. Um, I was probably spending more time at the beer stand than I was watching the band. Right. Um, so the, there's, there's two more questions here. Uh, what, what should, what should, uh, what should people who are generally into say extreme metal but have uh, like a slight interest in uh, music from the seventies? What what could you say about the heavy psych compilations that you put together? And uh, where where can we find those uh, if if we seek? Them? I don't know. They, they used to be easy to find because there used to be tons of like um, blog spots where people just fucking blatantly uploaded music and people were downloading it. There were all these like European guys that had like blog pages and they were fucking, you know, in a way they were, you know, they were hurting the labels that put this stuff out, which I'm not even sure how many of the labels that were, you know, that was kind of a lawless era, you know, like yeah. there were European companies putting out CDs of old obscure records and like, I'm not exactly sure they were all legit. I know for a fact that they weren't all legit. There's tons and tons of bootleg pressings of all that obscure 70s stuff. Not all of it, but a great deal of it has been bootlegged over and over and over again. Not, I wouldn't even call them bootlegs. They're counterfeits. Right. You know, or they used the original artwork and everything and just took an old rare record and repressed it. And, uh, <clears throat> but I made these comps originally for myself. Um, I got turned on to heavy, obscure heavy music by Lee and Gaz when we were traveling in the van and they would have like tapes. Gaz had a lot of tapes that he got from the guy. Um, I don't know the dude's name, but he ran a fan club for black Sabbath. And I think it was called the black Sabbath appreciation society. This is in the pre internet days. And Gaz used to get tapes from the guy and the guy would just record him all of this. This guy was really heavily into obscure prog and, heavy psych and stuff. And so Gaz had all these tapes of bands that most people had never heard of and could not find the records. And uh, he would play them in the van. And I was like, Oh, I, I've made notes of a few of them, you know, like, Oh, I got to find that record, you know? And one day we were in a record store. We were at um, this amazing record store in Rochester, New York called the house of guitars, which is also an amazing guitar store. I love that place. Uh, and, uh, and you can imagine back in those days when no one cared about records, there were so many fucking amazing things. I remember finding, we found like uh, several copies of the first Pentagram record in there in like the dollar bin. Jesus Christ. That's how no one gave a fuck about those records. And another one was the Sir Lord Baltimore record with the, the first one, which, you know, we found several copies of that as well. And uh, Gaz was pulling them all out of the box and, um, uh, I'm like, well, I've, I've seen that record around before. Is that thing any good? I remember my friend's older brother had it. And I know I'd heard it once because a, a friend of mine named Bill Cook, uh, in the, when, when I was in high school, his, he had all these cool, like obscure, heavy rock records that his brother had left him. His brother had gone away to college and left all of his records behind. And he had like Jane and Lord such and heavy friends and that first Sir Lord Baltimore record. <clears throat> so Gaz was like, oh, just buy one of these. They were like a dollar or two dollars or whatever. So I took it home and, um, you know, fell in love with it, obviously. And so that's how I got into it a little bit. And then years later, when I was living in L.A. and I started buying records again, um, I just started buying that stuff up. And then the Super Bees were out playing a lot of shows at that time. We would do like West Coast tours and play up in San Francisco all the time. So I started making these comps to listen to in the van. And pretty soon I had a whole bunch of them. And I gave them to a couple people. I gave them to like Greg Anderson from Southern Lord. And um, he gave them to a few, you know, cool people that sort of fucking gave them to some other cool people. Next thing I know, they were, they were everywhere, you know. Then like people were uploading them on blog spots and shit. Yeah, yeah. So. That's, that's awesome. So, so hopefully... Hopefully, if you if you punch those things into those titles into Google, 
Hopefully at least someone there's like a list of the songs on each comp. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, if not, uh, if not, I might have to search it out yeah. and try and put it somewhere prominent for people to uh, yeah. to check out because uh, it, it, the first one definitely blew my mind. The, way, the funny thing is, uh, my my friend Mike, uh, who lives in New York, you've met him before, mm -hmm. Mike Rosecloss. He he's the guy that laid out the Repulsion album cover. Yep. Uh, and he um he actually I gave those to him. And um, he, his friend was like spinning them at uh, at this bar in Manhattan. And whenever Mike wanted to hear a track, he would go up to the DJ and say, "Hey, play that song." And the guy would be like, "Which one is it on?" So Mike made artwork for all of them, Amazing. so that he could then, so then he could, and they were all it was the same art on all of them, but they were different colors. Yeah, yeah. And then he and he only gave them to a couple people. And so the DJ guy, he'd go, oh, it's on the green one. And the guy would go, oh, yeah, okay, the green one. And he would pull it up in his, you know, he was DJing with like a laptop or whatever. So when those things got uploaded onto the internet, they were uploaded with Mike's artwork. Oh, that's And awesome. I was completely unaware that <laughs> somebody made artwork that, or that Mike made the art. You know, I was talking to Mike one day and I'm like, dude, those fucking comps, they're like on a website and like someone made artwork for them. And I sent him a link to the page and he's like, I made the fucking artwork. And it was like, <laughs> just nuts. That's, that's, that's an amazing footnote for that. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Okay. So I'm going to have to really search that out. Cause, uh, yeah, I, I would love I mean, it's that. gone. All that's, all those pages are gone. Um, God damn it. you know, there, there were just like, it was like heavy rock dot blog spot. Yeah. Yeah. Heavy seventies dot blog spot. <laughs> there was all the, there were tons and tons and tons of them. I probably still have bookmarks in my fucking uh, browser for some of these things that are long gone. Yeah, yeah. There's a page now on Facebook called The Day After the Sabbath. And years ago, that was another blog spot. It was a, there was a blog called The Day After the Sabbath. And the guy that ran it would just put up these comps of, you know, weird heavy psych tracks that he was pulling from all over the internet and off CDs and shit. And, um, Insane. So now, if you go on, I mean, if somebody was interested in that kind of music, I would suggest going to the uh, to Facebook and going to the and joining the group the day after the Sabbath, because every day people <coughs> are posting shit up there. I think there's another one called like Heavy Belters. Heavy Belters, okay. Sweet. And Johnny from um, Admiral Sir, John, uh, from Gorilla and Admiral Sir Cloudsy Shovel. He puts up a lot of cool stuff up on there. Sweet. He's in that. That's awesome. Yeah, Heavy Belters and uh, Day After the Sabbath. That's awesome. Um, okay, so for the, the last the last question, so you can go, because I've, I've probably kept you far too long. Um, <laughs> people who visit LA, three places they should eat. Well... Man, that's a tough one. <laughs> I know, I know. But I'm going to say Allen B's. Allen B's? Yeah. The bean and cheese burrito. Yeah. You know it. Yeah, I know it. Yeah. yeah. I, I, call that, I call that era of my life where you and I had a lot of downtime. <laughs> if, if I'm going to write a book about all the stupid shit that I've uh, managed to do in my life uh, at the end of the day, that chapter is going to get called lunch. <laughs> oh, yeah. The bean and cheese era. <laughs> yeah. We were on a mission to try every bean and cheese burrito in LA we could find. Yep. <laughs> man, oh man, that's a really tough one. Uh, three places. <sighs> Nowadays, I would say Pura Vita, which is a vegan Italian restaurant on um, Santa Monica Boulevard. Absolutely right. incredible. Wait, is that, the, is that the one near where I used to live? Yes. It's oh, right around the corner. Yeah. Was uh, that there when you lived there? I think it was, but I I just maybe it I, had just opened. I, I didn't go there because like I I didn't want to go by myself, and no one else at the time was even remotely interested in the idea of going to eat a vegan meal. Yeah, it's right around the corner. It's just a few doors west of Harper. Wow. On the okay. south side of the street. Amazing. Incredible. Um, yeah, I don't know. A third one. Um, I would say just go to every taco truck you can find. Every taco truck. Most of them are great. Sweet, yeah. sweet. There's a lot of good taco trucks out there. Uh, 
would would you would you do favorable mentions for uh, Chili Johns? Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> certainly. If yeah. you like, if you like chili, yeah, 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 yeah. I I I would certainly uh, put in favorable mentions for Chili Johns, and <laughs> and for the fact that it even made it to uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah, and it's about a hundred years old that place. Yeah, it. It, it like it about 100 is years, I think. 100 yeah. years old, right? Same location? It's right up there. Uh, no, I don't think it's... I think it started in Wisconsin or something like that right, and then moved right, out right. there. But they've yeah. been in L.A. in Burbank since like the 40s or something like that. Right, right. Yeah. Man, you caught me off guard. There's so many fucking <laughs> amazing places to uh, to eat in L.A. Well, if you if you have any more off, off the top of your head right now, um, list them out. Otherwise, we'll call it a day. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, my kitchen. That's the next place I'm going <laughs> to yeah. eat. All right. So, so yeah, thank you for taking the time. As always, man. Uh, it's my pleasure to see you. Yeah, man. It's, all, it's always good to see you. And, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be getting back soon as, as soon as the borders open.